Welcome, everybody. I'm David Levy. I'm dean of the Duke Law School. This is a very special panel that we have today, Brown versus Board of Education, past, present, and future. You can tell by the people sitting up here today that this is a, a rare and, and very lovely event. When we think about the civil rights movement, um, at least when I think about it, I think of those lines from uh, Dickens from um, The Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times, it was the worst of times, the season of light, the season of darkness, the spring of hope, the winter of despair. Such a dramatic time that brought out both the best in people and the worst in people. And it was a time when there were heroes and heroines and those people and those careers brought many of us, many people, into the law. And the story is so riveting and to this day continues to inspire people to choose a career in the law. It's wonderful to have this panel here before us. Now, I'm not going to introduce the panel, but I'm going to introduce two of our moderators, and we'll see what role they play here today. It may be that they won't get a word in edgewise, and they're content with that. And they're seated before me. Uh, we have Professor Charles Klotfelter, who is the Z. Smith Reynolds Professor of Public Policy Studies and Professor of Economics and Law. He has a PhD in economics from Harvard. Fortunately, he also has a BA from Duke. He is the author of the book, After Brown, The Rise and Retreat of School Desegregation. He has a joint appointment at the, at the law school and he's a friend to our school. Seated next to him is Professor Neil Siegel, who joined our faculty in 2004. He has a BA and an MA from Duke. He has a JD and a PhD from Bolt Hall, University of Berkeley. He clerked for Justice Ginsburg and Judge Wilkinson. Uh, he's a brilliant fellow and a good friend. He likes Duke basketball. Uh, he's also um, written extensively on school integration and desegregation, most recently in his 2006 Duke Law Journal article on race conscious student assignment plans. So those are our moderators. Now, our program today um, involves many students who have helped to put on this program and who are going to play the principal role. Uh, each one of our panelists will be introduced by a student. We have a video to show you. And I now turn the podium over to Aisha Gale to introduce Professor Charles. <clears throat> Professor Charles received his JD from the University of Michigan Law School where he was editor-in-chief of the Michigan Journal of Race and Law. After law school, he finished his PhD studies in political science at the University of Michigan. Professor Charles then clerked for the Honorable Damon J. Keith of the United States Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit and subsequently taught as an adjunct professor, professor at the University of Toledo School of Law and was the James S. Carpenter Visiting Professor of Law at Columbia Law School. Professor Charles teaches and writes in the areas of constitutional law, civil procedure, election law, law and politics, and race. His articles, among them Race Redistricting and Representation and Judging the Law of Politics, have appeared in Constitutional Commentary, the Michigan Law Review, the Georgetown Law Journal, the California Law Review, and the North Carolina Law Review, among others. He was the Stanley V. Kenyon Teacher of the Year at the University of Minnesota Law School and has just stepped down from a deanship there. Professor Charles was a member of the National Research Commission on Elections and Voting and the Century Foundation Working Group on Election Reform. He is the director of the Institute for Law and Politics, a senior fellow in law and politics at the Institute on Race and po Poverty, and a law school faculty affiliate at the Center for the Study of Political Psychology at the University of Minnesota. He is a frequent television, print, and radio commentator on issues relating to constitutional law, election law, campaign finance, redistricting, politics, and race. <clears throat> and after speaking with him today, he is also a very cool professor. <laughs> and we are so honored to have him with us here today. Thank you so much, Aisha. I uh, will pay you later. 
Um, I'm pleased to be here to participate in this event on Remembering Brown. I'm grateful to Dean Levy uh, and the sponsors of the event, in particular the Duke Forum on Law and Social Change and the students who organized this event uh, for inviting me and issuing this invitation. Uh, my task this afternoon is to give an intro into the meaning of Brown v. Board, and I'm going to do that in two parts. Um, first, I, what I'd like to do is I'd be remiss not to say a few words about uh, the folks who are on this panel, even though they will be formally introduced later. This is kind of like a Sesame Street um, event. You know, one of these people don't belong on the panel, <laughs> and it's very obvious that, uh, who one of those people are. Uh, the second part, uh, after a brief introduction to the video, um, I'll come back and say a little bit more about Brown. But let me just uh, express my gratefulness. You know, I'd be grateful to share a room with uh, these folks on the panel, uh, much less uh, a stage. And if I may be so bold to characterize their role, because in part that will help us understand um, the intro to my understanding of the meaning of Brown. Um, when I think of Professor Franklin, I think of a chronicler, um, though he has occupied a number of roles uh, in his professional career. Uh, but Professor John Hope Franklin has certainly made his mark on my life as the chronicler of the role that race has played in the American context. And when this invitation was issued, I was in the process of rereading a book from uh, a book of his on Reconstruction uh, and thinking about the relationship between race, citizenship, and politics. Uh, the relationship among race, citizenship, and politics, which I think in large part um, is important to what Brown stands for. And for me, he was the first historian to explore the complexity of black agency. Uh, I mean, when I think of Brown v. Board, I also think about the meaning of citizenship and agency. What does it mean to create a world in which individuals and citizens can be agents without being restricted by the social caste system? And for me, Professor Franklin opened that door to help me understand Brown better, how ordinary black folks and black legislators post after the Civil War and during Reconstruction created a world for themselves where they can be or try to become full citizens of these United States of America, a world that came into being only with the advent of Brown. When I think of Jack Greenberg, I think of a crusader. It is for this world full of, of full citizenship that Professor Jack Greenberg crusaded tirelessly with others such as Thurgood Marshall, Spotswood Robinson, uh, Robert Carter, et cetera. And I have to tell you that I went to law school in large part as a result of these civil rights pioneers. I had two people, two entities that, that sent me to law school, one of whom may be familiar to some of you. Um, if you remember the show Matlock, Ben Matlock was a great lawyer, right? He solved everything in 30, some of you may not remember the show Matlock, only Dean Levy and I might remember the show Matlock. Um, solved everything in 30 minutes, and at the end of the day, always pointed his finger and said, that's the individual. Um, but on a serious note, when I, the civil rights lawyers, uh, the folks like Jack Greenberg and Thurgood Marshall in particular, when I thought of going to law school, they were the ones that I thought about. They were the crusaders for justice and the meaning of full citizenship that led us to the monumental event that became Brown v. Board. And these civil rights lawyers crafted a legal strategy that hastened the passing of a legal system and regime built upon this odious concept of racial apartheid that Brown sought to destroy. And when I think of Judge Pollock, I think of an enforcer a judge for whom the Constitution's command to racial equality could not be compromised as both a lawyer and a judge, a person for whom the principle of the rule of law bowed before no state actor, no matter how recalcitrant, no matter how impervious to justice, no matter how unwilling the actor. To recognize these individuals is to, is to begin to grapple with the constitutional and social phenomenon that came to be memorialized at, as Brown v. Board. To recognize these individuals is to begin to explore the meaning of Brown and to place it into the social context in which it found itself and today in which we find ourselves. 
but struggling with understanding what racial equality truly means, struggling with understanding how to deal with racial inequality, and struggling to understand cases such as parents, parents involved and what would lead Justice Roberts to pen, in my view, such a very, very bad opinion. <laughs> so before we get, all, we get there, and before I come back and say a few more minutes, um, we have a uh, short uh, video um, that will provide some of you with the background, uh, pictures of, uh, of some of the events that took place, and then I'll come back and wrap up for a couple minutes on more on concepts related to Brown. The video, please. I always wanted to say that. <laughs> There's a place where dreams have all gone They never said where But I think I know It's miles through the night Just over the dawn On the road that will take me home My children had to go to a separate school for black students clear across town, no matter how far. And I resented that. You just want things to be liked, you know, to be like they should be. public education, the doctrine of separate but equal, has no place. It will not be possible to protect the lives and property of the citizens if forcible integration is carried out tomorrow in the schools of this community. The crowd moved in close and they began to follow me calling me names. Then somebody started yelling. Mob rule can not be allowed to override the decisions of our court. We've come a long way, but there is a lot more that needs to be done, I'm sure.
Thank you. I remember when I first read Brown. It is not a very long opinion, and to think that such a short opinion could have had such a huge impact. For the formalists and doctrinalists among us, we know that the 14th Amendment states in part, nor shall any state deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. And of course, it's a doctrinal matter. The court decided in Brown that separate elementary public schools violated the Equal Protection Clause's guarantee to equal protection of the laws. And of course, those of you who've had first year constitutional law, you know that your law professors like to play the game of, well, what does equal protection mean? All right. Uh, so in this context, does equal protection mean that where you have separate facilities, um, though equal facilities, uh, assuming that they could be made equal, does that violate the Constitution's protection of equal protection? And you all know that the Supreme Court said in Brown that separate is inherently unequal. And part of the question in terms of thinking about the meaning of Brown and situating Brown is exploring and trying to understand what it is about separateness that leads to inherent constitutional inequality. So the court asked the question, does segregation of children in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities? And the court answered that question, we believe it does. One of the law professor games I like to play with my students when I teach this class is to say, okay, here's a hypothetical. You've heard that term. Um, suppose that uh, black kids can get better education in all black schools. Right? Would it be constitutional to have separate public facilities? In Brown, the court concluded segregation of white and colored children in public schools has a detrimental effect upon the colored children. In part, the court's conclusion was based upon um, the instrumental and consequential effects of segregation. In part, the court's conclusion was based upon what it viewed as the inconclusiveness of the historical record. Uh, in part, the court's conclusion was based upon the meaning of education to a concept of citizenship and formal equality. And so, the court concluded in the field of education, and then went on later on to expand that concept. In the field of education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate educational facilities are inherently unequal. And with that, the court declared the formal end of the caste system. Let me briefly offer two possibilities for Brown that are fairly standard to all of you, but places this in context. One possibility is that Brown is concerned with state-sponsored um, formal inequality, right? Deep state segregation, officially enforced by the state. And that possibility certainly has a lot of respect from, from a lot of constitutional law scholars, certainly has a lot of respect and the public, so when you ask people why is it that we don't believe in segregation, and they say, well, there's something about the state separating people that, is in that inherently violates the Constitution. Let me also offer another possibility, and that possibility is that Brown, the meaning of Brown, is about equal citizenship. And what we're talking about when we think about state-sponsored segregation is not, sim is not simply the state itself saying that folks of different races must be separated as a formal matter, but what this means as, a, as thinking about citizenship, assuming that folks of color were at the founding. Right? Imagine, if you will, if people of color were, were at the creation of the Constitution. What type of a constitutional structure would they have written? What would the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause be? And how should that help us understand and grapple with why we must remember Brown today? I will leave you with this. 
Importantly, it is important to recognize that though formal inequality is a problem and one that, um, that we've struggled with as a society, we must also think about the meaning of educational racial outcomes. So suppose we live in a world in which, let's take folks of color as an example, in which the infant mortality rate for folks of color are higher than it is, say, for whites. Let's say that educational opportunities for folks of color are worse than it is for whites. Let's say that um, marriage rates are worse than it is for people of color. And let's even say that people of color die at an earlier age than whites do. All of this is generally true. I like to think of this as from the very beginning, you're less likely to be born and you're more likely to be die and everything in between is problematic. <laughs> and the question there becomes, this, have we arrived at a world in wh in where you have that type of inequality of outcome? Is that consistent with a meaning of Brown that has presage and helped us to understand full citizenship as it should be understood by the Constitution? My task here is done because I stand between you and the introduction of three absolute luminaries who will help us understand how we got to Brown and how we ought to understand and interpret it. So I thank you for indulging us in understanding and setting up the, con the context of where Brown is and how we might understand its importance. Thank you very much. My name is Monique McNelly, and I'll be introducing Judge Pollock to you, who's the panelist on the far left. Um, he has been described as the quintessential expression of the essence of being judicial. I'm going to take a few moments to talk with you about his career and the path that he has followed. He started off as an undergraduate at Harvard University and went on to Yale Law School and then clerked for a Supreme Court justice. He's been an associate at Paul Weiss in New York and has also been a lawyer of the State Department. <coughs> Judge Pollack was both professor and dean at Yale and the University of Pennsylvania. Most, most of his teaching and writing has focused on constitutional law issues, and there have been too many for me to recount for you today, but the one that I will mention is his contributions to the writing of the Brown Brief, the Brown v. Board of Education Brief. Judge Pollack has spent almost 30 years with the NAACP's Legal Defense Fund. He started as a volunteer lawyer and then became the vice president. And that's where he worked with Thur Thurgood Marshall on briefs for the school segregation cases that culminated in Brown v. Board of Education. Judge Pollack has been known for getting Supreme Court justices to understand both the extent of racial tension and the intensity of the feelings of rejection that have that come to a person sitting at a lunch counter for the sit-in cases. One of the most important responsibilities of being a judge is having judicial balance, recognizing its importance, maintaining it, and striving for it where it doesn't exist. Judge Pollack is credited with having an innate ability to balance items of importance, such as resolving conflicts in a fair and impartial manner, balancing the respect for tradition with an appreciation for human dignity, and showing us that it is possible to maintain the respect of the American public and maintain the proper role of the judiciary. He says that he values listening to others because it presents an opportunity to learn from them no matter what walk of life they come from. And this lends to his intricate understanding of the value of all people having the opportunity to express themselves but he does much more than lend an ear. He's helped pave the path for many by, help, by leading law schools in the recruitment of women and minorities. And beyond recruiting law students, Judge Pollack is a public force for civil rights, liberties, and racial diversity. I'm introducing Professor Greenberg today. 
Professor Jack Greenberg is a civil rights attorney and professor of law at Columbia University who was on the front lines of the struggle to eliminate racial discrimination in U.S. society. Professor Greenberg's dedication to public service through the law began at Columbia Law School, where he was involved in a program called Legal Survey, which operated like a clinic in the area of civil liberties. Through this course, Greenberg worked with social activist groups, the ACLU, labor unions, the American Jewish Committee, and the NAACP. He was recommended to Thurgood Marshall for further work on projects with the NAACP because Greenberg recognized that the fight against racial discrimination in the United States was a vital way to advocate, advocate for human rights and civil liberties. He served 35 years following law school as an assistant counsel and director counsel at the NAACP, Legal Defense and Education Fund, alongside the late Supreme Court Justice Marshall. He regularly traveled to the South to defend African Americans against racially motivated charges and was personally threatened by violent organizations like the Ku Klux Klan in the course of his advocacy. With the Legal Defense Fund, Greenberg sought the repudiation of the se separate but equal doctrine under Plessy v. Ferguson, and notably in Parker v. University of Delaware, Greenberg and colleague Lewis Redding won black students admission to the University of Delaware, which was the first state-financed undergraduate institution in the United States to be desegregated by the courts. He was also on the ground in Topeka, working the landmark Brown v. Board of Education case, and served as co-counsel from the trial level all the way through the United States Supreme Court. Greenberg's book chronicles these activities. It's titled Crusaders in the Courts, and it describes all of his work done from the, with the Legal Defense Fund up until Brown and beyond. Uh, he advocated there for integration, attacking the death penalty, helping rights organizations for Mexican Americans and other groups, promoting human rights abroad. Greenberg's commitment to human rights can also be traced through his service on the boards of a number of organizations in addition to the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. He was a founding member of the Mexican American Legal Defense and Education Fund, a board member of the Asian American Legal Defense and Education Fund, and served as a board member on the Human Rights Watch organization from 1978 to 1998. Professor Greenberg has served on the faculty of Columbia Law School since 1984 and served as the Dean of Columbia College from 1989 to 1993. He has been honored many times for his contributions to civil rights, civil liberties, and human rights causes. In 1996, he received the Thurgood Marshall Award from the American Bar Association for his substantial and long-term contributions to the furtherance of civil and human rights in the United States. In 2001, Greenberg received the Presidential Citizens Medal from President Clinton in recognition of 50 years of exemplary deeds of service defending civil and human rights. President Clinton commented, in the courtroom and the classroom, Jack Greenberg has been a crusader for freedom and equality for more than half a century. In 2004, Greenberg received an honorary doctor of law from Howard University, the historically black institution intimately involved with the civil rights movement through its notable graduates and deans, including Justice Marshall, Spotswood Robinson III, and Charles Hamilton Houston. We too, on behalf of Duke Law School, hope to honor Greenberg with our humble welcome and thanks for all he's done so far and sharing his time with us today. <coughs> Good evening. I have the pleasure of introducing to you all a great icon in American history. Professor John Hope Franklin is the recipient of numerous awards, including the John W. Kluge Prize for Lifetime Achievement in, his, in the Study of Humanity and the Presidential Medal of Freedom. He's also been the recipient of honorary degrees from more than 100 colleges and universities. Professor Franklin has published several books including Mirror to America, the autobiography of John Hope Franklin, and From Slavery to Freedom, now in its eighth edition. Professor Franklin was born in Oklahoma in 1915. He was named, he was named after John Hope, who was another great African-American educator and activist and who helped found the Niagara Movement. His mother was a school teacher and his father was a lawyer. His father was the reason why he wanted to go to college and be a lawyer himself. Once he got to Fisk University, he decided to change and become a historian. Uh, after Fisk University, he went and received his doctorate at Harvard University. 
Following Harvard University, Professor, Professor Franklin taught history at Howard for a number of years. He was publicly involved in segregation that was plaguing this country, and he was, plagued, and he was publicly against the segregation that was going on in Washington, D.C. He was invited to teach at several universities, including Harvard University as a visiting professor, the first African-American professor to teach at Harvard Law. He was also invited to teach at Wisconsin and at Cornell. But he began to realize that it was more than about preaching for change. It was about doing change. At this time, during the following fall, he was invited, or he says commanded, to work with Thurgood Marshall <laughs> on the Brown decision. Uh, there was actually a story that he told in Stetson, I hope you don't mind me telling, about, um, <laughs> um, about uh, the first time that he actually met with Thurgood Marshall, um, or the first time that he worked with Thurgood Marshall. Uh, there was a student named Lyman Johnson who graduated and wanted to, to start his graduate career at the University of Kentucky. Instead, they were telling him that he could be very much fine going to the Kentucky State College for Negroes. Um, pro uh, Professor John Hope Franklin was asked to work on the case and tell exactly why it was more important to go to the University of Kentucky instead of the Kentucky State College for Negroes. And so he talks about how he went through all of this work and all of this time trying to, trying to build up the resume and basically tell the judge why there was such a big difference between the two schools. And during the actual court case, um, Thurgood Marshall was there and other people were there and, and the president and everyone else was there. And they were talking about uh, why the University of Kentucky was not really all that great of a school anyway, so why would he want to come here? He's pretty much fine going to the Kentucky State College for Negroes. Um, and from what I read, uh, Professor John Hope Franklin said, well, you know, he, he, was, he was basically thrilled, you know, excited about being able to go up there and rebut all the things that they said. But uh, as most people who've read about uh, Thurgood Marshall know, um, he sometimes has a way of changing his mind. So he said, I'm tired of all this. He said that instead, I'm just going to go up there and tell the judge that I'm tired of all this playing around. I'm just going to ask him that they haven't said anything. And they should just let Lyman Johnson come in. And so everyone was saying, you know, are you, are you sure? Are you sure that you want to do this? I mean, that's kind of risky. And he said, no, I'm just going to go straight to the judge and ask him. And so after a recess, he said, uh, Thurgood Marshall came up and said, um, you know, I would like Lyman Johnson to be admitted to the University of Kentucky. And the judge said, done. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and from what I read, uh, Professor John Hope Franklin was obviously happy that this happened, but uh, he, got a, he didn't get a chance to shine that day. <laughs> But he was able to shine a lot more during the Brown versus Board of Education panel, where he worked with Thurgood Marshall on several nights and several occasions, building up the resume and letting people know why separate is not equal and separate has never been equal. But his work and his experience did not end at the Brown versus Board of Education. It was only the beginning, actually. The very next year, he chaired the history department at Brooklyn College which was the, he was the very first person, the very first African American to chair that, um, that position and was actually featured on the front page of the New York Times for doing so. He's been appointed to the Fulbright Board of Scholarships. He's been appointed to the United States delegation to the UN, uh, as the United States delegate to the UN Education, Scientific and Cultural Organization. He's been the president of the American Historical Association, the Southern Historical Association and the American Studies Association. He, he is now currently appointed as one of six members to the President's Commission on Race, called the One American Initiative. And he's taught in nearly a half dozen countries, at Cambridge University in, UK, in, the, uh, in the United Kingdom, in Australia, and the People's Republic of China, and the Soviet Union. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my humble honor and pleasure to introduce to you a professor, a historian, an author, and an icon. Professor John Hope Franklin. Good evening. Well, I too want to wish you a warm welcome 
to Duke Law School. Our students have studied what you did and what you have written, and they are very excited that you are here. And I want to thank you. I think we all want to thank you for everything that you did to begin redeeming our Constitution and our country. It is not often in law that one encounters a genuine American hero, and today uh, we find ourselves in the presence of three of them. There is a lot of questions I have, but I think I want to stop and just open it up to you folks. You've just heard a lot, you've just seen a lot, and I want to give you whatever opportunity you would like right, to speak uh, for yourselves um, about anything, um, really anything that you want. <laughs> And if not, if not, I could, I could get us started with a question that, that goes to the meaning of Brown. I'd be happy to do that. I'd like to, I'd like to respond to that uh, wonderful and uh, somewhat uh, inaccurate uh, introduction <laughs> of me. Um, let me say in the first place that, that I, uh, first I want to welcome Dean Levy. Uh, uh, this is my first public occasion that I can welcome him. Uh, I've known him since he was a high school student. <laughs> and uh, his father was one of my closest friends when he was president of the University of Chicago. I would say secondly that um, the experience that I had during, during the litigation of Brown against the board was the result uh, of my rejection of the uh, practice of law when uh, I was in college. Um, the reason I rejected it was that uh, the first year that I was in college, we lost our home. Uh, we were in the midst of the Great Depression. I was not sensitized to that. I thought that my father was uh, an erat erratic practitioner of the law, and he was starving us to death. <laughs> uh, I learned uh, somewhat later that uh, there were other forces operating to keep us from our daily bread. Uh, and uh, I have long since repented for my indictment of my father for his dereliction of duty. <laughs> uh, then, finally, I want to say that in the course of my uh, preparation, I did offer uh, law of the Constitution as one of my fields for my doctorate. And uh, I did witness some great occasions at the Harvard Law School when I would uh, go over there uh, to listen to the uh, law expounded by some of the great people, some of the great legal scholars of all time. And I was present the day that uh, Felix Frankfurter was uh, confirmed by the state, by the United States Supreme Court to go on the, uh, by the United States Congress to go on the Supreme Court and uh, I heard his farewell address. That's by way of, of indicating that I was, I had my interest in the law, uh, although I had uh, long since abandoned any notion that I would starve my family to death by practicing law. <laughs> I am uh, especially proud to be back here at the law school where I spent seven wonderful years and where I learned that uh, you didn't have to starve to be a lawyer. <laughs> I'm, I was uh, particularly pleased to have the opportunity to teach here for seven years because as I have said in my own autobiography, I don't believe my life would have been complete without the experience that I had here in the law school. It was simply a marvelous and refreshing and profitable 
experience. I learned a great deal. It was all new to me, and it was a wonderful experience. But on the way here, I uh, <clears throat> had some experiences, uh, one of which has been mentioned, some experiences which helped me a great deal in later life. Uh, I was the uh, expert witness, I guess you would say, in the case of Lyman Johnson against the University of Kentucky. And uh, the thing that I remember most about that experience is that I didn't get a chance to testify <laughs> because Thurgood sped up the process by insisting that the judge, Judge H. Church Ford, hand down the decision based on the lack of information that the University of Kentucky advanced. And uh, so, although most were shouting, I was pouting <laughs> because I really wanted to show off uh, on, the, on the witness stand. But I, uh, I made an impression, I suppose, on Thurgood at the time because uh, he later <coughs> called me when at the beginning of the litigation of Brown to ask me if I would testify, that is, assist in the writing of the, of the brief. And uh, I said I, I would. And uh, he proceeded to bring me to Washington every week from August to November to work with Jack Greenberg and others in trying to answer the questions which the court had propounded when it uh, uh, <clears throat> remanded the case back uh, to, the to the attorneys on both sides uh, with questions which had to be raised. And the question of the moment and the one that preoccupied us for the next several months was the question of whether or not the legislators had in mind the abolition of segregation in the schools when the Constitution was written, later when the 14th Amendment was enacted, and when the people ratified uh, these documents, um, did they know that they wanted to eliminate segregation. Now, obviously, we didn't know a great deal about the law. But we did know something about the, the effort that was made on the part of, 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 of people in the period of the Constitution, uh, in the period of the uh, ratification of the 14th Amendment, and at other times, we knew. And we made it clear, I hope we made it clear, Jack, to the uh, to counsel that, uh, they had it, they, that they had in mind, those who acted on the 14th Amendment and other proposals, had in mind the elimination of segregation. And uh, I don't know really, we didn't find that all that much in the federal law or in the Constitution itself that would affirm this uh, determination that we had to eliminate segregation in the public schools. But the thing that really, the thing that we really accomplished was that we made, I'm sorry, Jack, we made the historian, we made the, the law staff, the legal staff, experts in constitutional history, in the history of of the, the Reconstruction period and in the period following that. And uh, we, I, I, I would love to, uh, to impress you with the fact that when these lawyers started with us, they were stumbling and fumbling 
over these provisions of the Constitution. But before they argued this case before the Supreme Court, they were expert witnesses themselves. And uh, the most satisfying experience that I had was to listen to the lawyers on the Lincoln Defense Fund as they expounded on the law as great legal historians. And I could say to myself, that's my boy, <laughs> uh, that's my girl, uh, because they were full, so proficient by that time. Uh, I, I would want to make some comments additionally about the, the ramifications and the result of Brown, but I'll let that go. Thank you. Hmm. I was wondering, Professor Greenberg, Judge Pollack, if I could get a sense from you of your present understanding of the meaning of Brown. And to get at this, I'd like to think about a recent Supreme Court decision, parents involved in community schools against Seattle School District number one. Recently, the Supreme Court, uh, for the first time uh, since Brown, significantly limited the ability of local communities to use race in order to integrate, racially integrate, their public schools. And in so doing, Chief Justice Roberts, on behalf of himself and Justices Scalia, Thomas, and Alito, wrote the following, and I'd like to get your reaction to it. This is Chief Justice Roberts. The parties debate which side is more faithful to the heritage of Brown, but the position of the plaintiffs in Brown, you folks, was spelled out in their brief and could not have been clearer. And then Chief Justice Roberts quotes from your brief in Brown, the 14th Amendment prevents states from according differential treatment to American children on the basis of, the color, of their color or race." End quote. Then Chief Justice Roberts asks rhetorically, what do the racial classifications at issue here do if not accord differential treatment on the basis of race? Before Brown, school children were told where they could and could not go to school based on the color of their skin. The school districts in these cases have not carried the heavy burden of demonstrating that we should allow this once again, even for very different reasons. The way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. In your view, did the Chief Justice fairly characterize what you said and, more importantly, what you meant in the Brown litigation? And if not, um, I'd like to give you the opportunity, if you're willing, to speak for yourselves about your understanding of what Brown means. The answer to your question is absolutely not. <laughs> um, there are five surviving lawyers who participated in the Brown case, and we count John Hope Franklin as a lawyer who makes six. <laughs> uh, and all of us have unanimously said that Chief Justice Roberts is wrong in his characterization of what we wrote in the, those in those briefs. Um, you have to understand we were not legal philosophers. Uh, we were not the jurisprudence, we were advocates. Uh, we not only wrote that brief in Brown, um, I would say that altogether maybe 12 or 14 briefs were written by the side of the plaintiffs in Brown. Uh, Brown was argued twice. The first time it was argued, there were five cases, if you want to count the District of Columbia case among them. The second time, it was five cases again. Uh, then on the... Um, the all deliberate speed argument, it was argued once more. Um, lawyers in those cases took positions as, as advocates in which they argued the non-discrimination or non-classification principle, and they argued the non-subjugation principle. They were trying to make arguments that would be persuasive to the court, which is what advocates do. They weren't writing a law review article. For him to pick out just one sentence uh, or even three sentences out of the briefs makes it absolutely nonsensical. And I think everyone who appeared, participated in Brown at that time agrees with me on that. I, uh, I would echo what, what Professor Greenberg has said <clears throat> very emphatically. Uh, it, um, it's not generally the, the role <clears throat> to uh, of an inferior court judge to uh, be um, uh, 
to engage in, in, in extended critiques of the opinions by which he's bound. Uh, <laughs> these, uh, but uh, but I I, re I really do regard the um, uh, the opinion of the plurality, and it was a plurality because it, Justice Kennedy's separate opinion makes the majority. Um, I think the plurality opinion was inappropriate in um, <clears throat> taking uh, the language of the brief and in a sort of gotcha mentality saying, <laughs> that's what you guys said in 1953 and, and we, the court, did what you told us to do and now you're <laughs> stuck with it. Uh, <clears throat> In a, in a litigation situ setting, it's inappropriate in the sense that uh, the parties before the court in the Louisville and Seattle cases were different parties. Um, uh, they weren't responsible for what appeared in the brown briefs. But passing that, the, the notion that the language used in 1953 in arguing the five cases uh, was not only what Jack has so precisely said, the language of advocates addressing a litigation situation, uh, but it was language that had its own historical context and it's the context which Professor Franklin was addressing in his professional uh, perspective. Brown was about the use of governmental authority to segregate people by race for the purpose of subordinating the minority race. And if you, if you want the clear text on that, I think um, John Hope Franklin has given it to us in so many of his writings, and uh, standing with it <clears throat> would be Van Woodward's classic work, The Strange Career of Jim Crow. That's what Brown was about, and to take in the Seattle and Louisville context in which government is trying to uh, trying to eliminate forms of disadvantage that may flow from decades of disparaged treatment of blacks and other persons of color to take that setting and say, you can't do what you're undertaking to do, the kind of reform you're undertaking, with its very, very modest use of race, only as one factor at a remote point. You can't do that because back in 1953, the Legal Defense Fund said, and quote the words, is, is to impose on the constitutional process an a historical um, flaw, it seems to me, of monumental proportions, and and really uh, it tends to to trivialize what uh, what the court did in 1954, <clears throat> and uh, unhappily did again last year. The the question of what Brown meant. I think is put in focus by Professor Charles's initial remarks, in which he sets up two possible ways of looking at Brown. We look at it as what government does and attach to that the concerns about if government gives its preference to one group and puts others in a secondary position is that not a disparagement which offends 
constitutional norms. And second, as I understood Professor Charles' uh, paradigm, is that was Brown really to be addressed as a lesson about citizenship? And it was both. And it has to stand for that as both today. Um, the, the citizenship sense is one of full participation in the American community. Uh, and that is hopefully what one would try to achieve through a variety of remedial enterprises. Uh, and to, to take the decision in a case which resolves systematic disparagement and transfer it to what uh, contemporary communities are trying to do to put all their citizens uh, in, a, in a common enterprise uh, was, in my view, highly inappropriate and uh, contravenes uh, what, what Brown fully understood uh, is really about. The citizenship axis is one which I think gets very good expression in some of the writings of Charles Black, who um, was one of the very important participants, um, helping Jack and Thurgood and the others who were the oral advocates in the framing of the briefs. Uh, that's what that's what was being done and uh, done importantly. Before I finish, let me say one further thing, if I may. Um, we much has been said, and much more should be said about John Hope Franklin's unique role. There's nobody like him. Um, I hope this audience knows what an extraordinary advocate Jack Greenberg is. Um, following Thurgood Marshall as director counsel of the Legal Defense Fund, his own career as a Supreme Court advocate, um, I think is statistically a clear match for Thurgood's. Um, case after case after case after case, Jack Greenberg would come to Washington and tell the Supreme Court in slow, measured terms what was to be done. <laughs> and the judges did it. And uh, uh, I had the privilege of hearing that rhetoric, that slow, low, um, <laughs> non polemic deliberate presentation, and it was marvelous. Thank you very much. Did you say you wanted to say a, a few more things about the historical work you had done in Brown? Did you want more of an opportunity to do that, John Hope? Me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, well, if, if we have a point uh, Yes. First, let me say that uh, by the time that uh, Thurgood Marshall asked me to to work on the case, and that was in the summer of 1953. I had been following the case uh, through the first term that it was argued, that is, the 52, 53 term. Uh, but then I, I was rather unhappy with the way things were turning out. I had thought that the, the court, in postponing the decision in the, in the spring of 1953, everyone was expecting a decision in Brown. It didn't come. Uh, I thought that the court was simply pulling some kind of special ploy for time or, or something. And uh, so I was rather, rather un, 
unhappy and un unwilling really to waste any more of my time uh, with uh, trying to trying to straighten out the court. Uh, and uh, I expressed some hesitation, some reluctance. When Thurgood asked me, he called me on the telephone. I was uh, teaching at Cornell University that summer. He said, what are you going to be doing in September? I said, I'm going back to the only job I have, <laughs> and probably the only job I ever will have. That's, the way, that's what I thought about higher education in this country. I had taught at Wisconsin and Harvard and Berkeley and so forth. And, and Cornell, and they were all just had me there for a semester, thank me, <laughs> send me on my way to the next job. <laughs> so I told Thurgood I was going back to the only job I had. I, was, I really wasn't interested in, in, in anything, not any appeal, because I didn't have any confidence in the court or in any, anyone to do something very effect, effective, very revolutionary about segregation in the United States. And I made it quite clear. Uh, and uh, I told Thurgood I didn't know whether I wanted to come to New York or not. And uh, I wish that I could repeat in polite company <laughs> what Thurgood said to me, but he said, if you don't, uh, if you don't agree, come and work on this case then you can fill in the rest. <laughs> you can know the kind of person he was. <laughs> and uh, I said, yes, sir. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and we worked, I can't tell you, we, we, we worked hard. Not merely, uh, and not, not merely the, the council, uh, Jack Greenberg and Cod and all the others. But the other non-legal group that was there, we worked hard. And I was teaching a full program at Howard University, coming back, coming to New York on Wednesday afternoon, and working Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday morning, and then getting, getting back on the, tra the train. No shuttle, please, in those days. Getting back on the train, coming back to, to Washington and getting ready for a Monday morning class. It was really arduous work. And I, I don't want anything, I don't want anyone to believe that it. it's a picnic going to New York every week and, and working as we did until midnight. Because at midnight, Thurgood would say, let's take a five minute break. <laughs> and I would break out around the corner to the Algonquin Hotel where I <laughs> remained until the next morning. <laughs> I don't work all night. I did. never will. Uh, but, but what we need to remember is the sacrifices that were made by the legal staff and the non-legal staff. I should never forget, I never went to the Legal Defense Fund offices for what I didn't see Thurgood Marshall sitting there. I don't, know, I don't know when he slept. I don't know if he slept. And uh, for him to tell, say, we'll have a break, he meant five minutes, I meant 10 hours or something like that. And, uh, and the, the, the achievement of this group I'm speaking of the lawyers now. The achievement of this group was one of the most remarkable things I've ever seen in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were, by that time, as I said, not only great lawyers, they were great historians too, great legal historians. They knew as much as we did about the Reconstruction period and the period thereafter. So. Uh, it, it, it was it was a wonderful, rich experience. I didn't I didn't I wasn't certain of that at the time, <laughs> especially when uh, we 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 did all that work, and then they came back with uh, 
uh, invitations to uh, attend the argument. I said, where is ours? He said, uh, Thurgood said, well, you know, <laughs> you're not a lawyer. We can't argue for you to have a, an admission to hear the arguments in, uh, before the Supreme Court. So all that work went, went to the legal staff. I almost said down the drain, but <laughs> went to the legal staff with nothing but thank you to the, uh, the non-legal staff. But uh, we, helped, we held our chin up and uh, we worked hard. Now, I did want to say something about uh, the subsequent history of Brown. Um, it's been disappointing all the way through, so far as I'm concerned. Um, there was never a time when I thought that the country was really interested in, in doing something significant, even revolutionary, about segregation in the schools or anywhere else. And so uh, every time I looked at what was going on, I was discouraged. I was pessimistic about the possible realization